Um, I just wanted to ask in regard to the great shape theory, um, if you could just say something about degrees of trust as far as, mm -hmm. I mean, especially for us here, um, just mm -hmm. the, the ideas of, you know, we do, there are shapes that, mm -hmm. that you know, embody attributes. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Great traditions and just mm -hmm. degrees of trust. That's a very good question. So the question here is that going back to the idea about the great sheikh or sheikha, because there are also women, and in fiqh there are a lot of women, by the way, and some of the greatest muftis of all were women. But you know, when we look at the great sheikh theory, um, of course, how does a man or a woman become a great sheikh? That's not what you're asking about, but that's essentially accomplishment, that they are regarded to be highly accomplished men and women, with great knowledge and with superior teachers. Okay, so they have teachers and then they are accomplished students of those teachers. That gives them their authority. But your question is trust. In other words, how do I know that I can trust this great Sheikh, right? To give me the tradition the way it ought to be. It's not an infallible person after all. Maybe they make a mistake. Maybe they don't have what I think they have. And this is a problem, of course, with qualified people wherever you have qualified people. How do you know that your doctor is actually a doctor? How do you know that your dentist knows what she's doing? How do you know that uh, the person doing your income taxes is not going to get you audited, for example? Right? So where you have doctors, you have quacks. Where you have great sheikhs, you have great frauds. Um, wherever you have any sort of person that has social and other types of status because of their accomplishment, you're going to have people that imitate them. And so one of the major things in the development of the schools, the schools of law, now we're not talking about these people themselves, is exactly that. Some people would say the schools of law begin when they can put down criteria for qualification. When they can authorize a great sheikh as a great sheikh. So this is one of the ways they did it traditionally, that you have authorization. And they would say that, yes, you may be a great sheikh, but we know, in fact, that you are. We have tested you, uh, and we now endorse you. This is really important because it also means that the school begins to come into a certain conformity, right? Conformity with certain standards. However, in all traditions, uh, there were things that went beyond that. So, for example, in Sufism, the Sufis used to say that the worst people you can ever meet are whom? They said there are three people, they're the worst people you can ever meet and ever be around in your life. They'll mess up your whole life. Who were those three people? Sufis. Ignorant Sufis, they would say. Ignorant Sufis. And hypocritical reciters of the Qur'an and tyrannical rulers. That if you, those three are deadly poison. So with the Sufis, if you read Sufi literature, one of the fundamental concerns of the Sufi is the false Sufi, the fraud, the quack, you know, the charlatan. And every Sufi book will tell you about the false sheikh. And they will also tell you how do you know the real sheikh. One of the things they will say, for example, is, Beware of the maker of claims. When you have a man or a woman making claims, I am this, I am that. You know, uh, they say, back off, because this is very dangerous. The real people don't make claims. Imam Malik made no claims. Imam Abu Hanifa made no claims. The Shafi'i, Ahmad, they made no claims. The great Sufis, they don't make claims. People make claims about them, but they themselves don't. Yes, Imam Malik would say, I'm not very good at what I do. That's his claim. He would say, most of the questions I'm asked, I don't know the answer to. You see, so this is really important, and the same applies to a muhaddith, the same applies to almost anything. A doctor, right? 
You know, how do you know that a doctor is not a quack? Well, we have to have standards. But this is why also it's really important, you know, for a Muslim, you know, never to close your eyes. You know, because uh, once you begin to submit to authority blindly, then you do get in trouble. You do get in trouble. You know, you, you no know, person has a right to tell you that you can't look at me, you can't criticize me. We believe as Muslims that you should do it politely. You know, so that there's a, there's a nice way to go about that, there's a rude way. But nevertheless, you don't ever take things on blind authority. And usually in the past, people tested people. Uh, Ahmad ibn Idris, who was one of the greatest Sufi sheikhs, and one of the most brilliant scholars of his age. I mean, almost every time that he met with another scholar, he had to be tested. It's like they've got to ask him about some word that nobody knows. They've got to ask him about some ruling or some hadith. And, and then he's got to prove it. He has to prove that he actually knows it. Very good question. <laughs>